The Tri-Village area happened in a sequential fashion with first the hamlet of Marble Cliff. The area grew slowly until the entrepreneurs began establishing quarries, the Marble Cliff Quarry among them. Silvio Casparis imported hundreds of Italians from the stone areas of Italy to work in his quarries. He actually had boarding houses down in the quarry where they were housed. And the village of San Margarita on the other side of the river originated with a lot of these families. The Casparis family built one of the first homes in the Arlington Place development. But subsequently, the family built their Scottish Highland castle down the street on Roxbury. If you read a lot about Silvio Casparis, he was not a nice man. You know, he drove his Italian workers to the limits. He built that tower five stories tall so he could keep his eyes on them. The limestone quarries of Columbus, Ohio, are producing the limestone that's building the buildings downtown. They're producing the building material for Ohio State University. The quarries really spawned the development of this particular area. In 1889, the Price Griswold families platted Arlington Place. They bought about 60 acres and platted that area along the bluff. They saw the opportunity to create an environment that would be really attractive as a place for high-income folks living in Columbus to move out into the country, if you will. There was a rail system through here, so the opportunity for transportation offered folks the opportunity to come to the area. The entire hamlet that was being established there was the first real suburb of Columbus. And because of the nature of who was building homes there, the suburb then took on the moniker of the millionaire suburb in local papers and the national press. George Erlen came from Canada, became a partner in a photographic business in Columbus. He owned the Columbus Bicycle Company, and he was also a real estate developer. He and two partners owned virtually all the land that is now Grandview Heights and were the folks who laid out the roads, the streets, and determined where the residential areas would be. The legend goes that his wife, once standing on the porch of their beautiful home on this hillside at Erlin and Goodale, looking out upon downtown Columbus, said, my, what a grand view, and the name stuck. The original boundaries of Marble Cliff also included what is now the southern part of Upper Arlington and the unincorporated part of Columbus called Sellsville. Sellsville was the area that encompassed the winter quarters of the Sells Brothers Circus that was basically from the Olentangy River on the east side to about Virginia Avenue, which is close to Kenny Road, on the west side, and then it was bordered by King Avenue and Fifth Avenue on the south and north. It is kind of an agricultural community in some ways because you've got people who need to be fed all the time. You've got animals. The Lenox Town Center now, that was one of the agricultural areas where they raised hay and grain for the circus animals. Everything you can imagine in Sellsville, we had. We had livery stables. We had hundreds of horses. We had butcher shops. Basically, circuses were traveling zoos at that time and would always have, you know, elephants, giraffes, hippos, rhinos, zebras. In the latter part of 1913, a man might have been seen leisurely strolling over the Miller land, observing its contours and viewing it in various directions at long range. This man was King G. Thompson. King Thompson and James T. Miller both shared the same family physician. And during his time with King Thompson, King Thompson had shared with him some of the challenges that he had been encountering developing land around the Ohio State University. The Thompson brothers had encountered so many difficulties with having smaller, non-contiguous areas of land. So he was expressing the desire to find one larger area that he could develop. At the same time, James T. Miller was experiencing a lot of trouble with vandals that would steal crops and livestock. So Dr. Van Fossen ended up introducing them as a result of that introduction, they ended up on Christmas Eve 1913, spending a very lengthy meeting in the Miller family farmhouse. 
My grandfather, King Thompson, and his brother, Ben, purchased 840 acres of Mr. Miller's farm in order to develop the village of Upper Arlington. Their vision for the community was to be a family-oriented, large homes, do I dare say upper class? That's what they wanted. I was having quite a lot of trouble with house sales due to the fact that there were no stores out in the Upper Arlington area. The husband would take the car in the daytime to drive into Columbus to work, and the wife would be stranded in Upper Arlington without places for the necessity of life type of shopping. Don Casto Sr. actually first started out working for the Upper Arlington Company. He was always a self-starter, always you had to be self-reliant. And he thought, gee, I, I can sell houses, but I can also build them. So he rented a mule team and started building a few homes. And he ended up building 30, 40% of the Arlington homes south of Lane. I was convinced that these suburban areas surrounding Columbus was the answer to the shopping center of the type I wanted to build. I searched all areas and finally located the track that I wanted to make this experiment on. It was located on Grandview Avenue between 1st and 3rd Avenue on the west side of the street. The interesting thing was that he wanted all of the stores up against the road. They wanted to be out closer to the street where they could have customer identification from passing traffic. I therefore installed on the parking area for 500 cars to the rear. It was indeed revolutionary for 1927. And in those first years, there was a parking attendant. And the ad said, ladies, you could leave your packages and even your children in the car. They will be safe because there's an attendant all day long to watch over them. The bank block was unique because of its mix of stores at the time, including Piggly Wiggly. It was the first place to have no cashiers other than to check you out. You picked up your own groceries, served yourself, put them in a basket, put them on the counter, and they were checked out. What was coming into being was a new way to shop. And the bank block is a classic early example of this, incorporating three grocery stores and a bank, which was why it was called the bank block. But more importantly, it merged retail and the automobile in one place at one time. 